anatomists and physiologists. This video is another video in our blood vessel series. Um, in this video, we're talking all about blood pressure, but specifically how blood pressure is regulated. So we're going to talk a lot about a word we've heard before, um, and I'm going to write it in big, bold, red letters called homeostasis. How do we come back to homeostasis of blood pressure? So let's chat about it. We talked for a while in Bio 430 about homeostasis and how it's maintained. And I always think of homeostasis as like this happy internal state of conditions. It's the thing we want to maintain, but it's also the thing that's constantly changing. So homeostasis is like two things. Its definition is stable internal conditions. Stable. That's the goal, right? But homeostasis is also really dynamic. And it's kind of like this balancing act that you see here. This is a table back from chapter one of our textbook, where that if we were to come off balance in some way, we would just try to come right back. So you shift out of balance and you come right back. Similarly, when you're on the freeway and you're driving, and if you were to kind of like drive outside of your lane just a little bit, you'd turn your steering wheel and come back and be in your lane. And if you were to go to the other side, you'd come back. That's homeostasis. And homeostasis is one of those things that we come back to all the time, especially in this class when we talk about clinical applications, um, and when things go wrong with our physiology, so how do we correct errors of homeostasis, right? And typically this is corrected in, in five steps. And I think if you can get really good at these five steps, then you can apply this to nearly every homeostatic imbalance that we'll talk about in every clinical application that we'll talk about for the rest of the semester. Okay, so let's go through this. I'm going to highlight as we go, the first step is a stimulus. A stimulus is just the change that throws off homeostasis. So if blood pressure gets higher or lower, that would be a stimulus, the thing that changes, the thing that gets thrown out of whack. The stimulus is detected by something, and that's in step two. That happens with the receptor. A shorthand for receptor um, is like a little curly QR like that. If you're looking for your notes, that's shorthand for receptor. A receptor is something that detects that change. It's the thing that's going to notice the change and then relay that information. Um, and that relay step, that's called input. That's step three. So the receptor sends that information up the line and that's input. This is done along the afferent pathway. Afferent means um, going towards the important thing. And in this case, the afferent pathway will take us via the input is taking us to the control center. The control center is usually the brain. Usually the brain. Or some part of the CNS. Usually the brain. This pathway of going to the important thing, the afferent pathway, leads us to the important thing, the brain usually, okay? And then the control center will make a decision about what's supposed to happen. Here's how you correct this. And that information is sent down the line then to the folks that need to deal with it. And that's called in step four, the output. That's sent along the efferent pathway. I always think of it, um, efferent or efferent is exiting um, the important thing, which is the control center, usually the brain. So we're going to communicate in the output to the body where we need to go. In that communication bit that we're going to, we're going to go talk to the effector. That's the part of the body that needs to know about it. So maybe that's a smooth muscle. Maybe that's a skeletal muscle. Maybe that's a gland to release some kind of a something. So it really just depends on what we're doing. And then lastly, step five is the fix it, the response. So that effector, its actions will have some kind of something that will fix this homeostasis. So in the case of blood pressure, it'll bring blood pressure back up or back down to where it's supposed to be. 
These steps are really important. So I think if you can remember these one, two, three, four, and five steps, the stimulus receptor input output response, I think that's really important to know. Oh, and of course the control center that's in between input and output. I think that's really important to know when we're talking about homeostasis. Okay. So then how is blood pressure actually regulated? There's some stuff going on here. And it's, of course, a homeostatic thing that we need to maintain. Um, but blood pressure is regulated through three major, three major avenues. So I'm going to draw like a little flow chart here. There's three major things that influence blood pressure. One of them we have a whole video about, which is cardiac output. which we know cardiac output is influenced by heart rate and stroke volume. So cardiac output or CO, we have lots of things about that, but more cardiac output means more blood pressure, right? And also we have total peripheral resistance, TPR. Again, we have a video about that one. Uh, more resistance means that we're fighting that pressure a little bit more. And then lastly, blood volume. Blood volume, how much blood is there? More blood volume, more blood pressure. And blood pressure changes throughout the day, okay? Um, these are short-term controls, how the body makes those small course corrections in blood pressure. And usually that happens for cardiac output and, and or total peripheral resistance, um, that blood pressure being maintained throughout the day. We call those short-term controls. Short-term. And short-term controls, again, typically affect cardiac output and or total peripheral resistance. But we also, so those short-term controls, that's typically done through one of two avenues. One of two avenues, you can do it with the nervous system. So we call that neural controls. Or there are hormonal controls. Hormonal controls are done through hormones. But sometimes blood pressure is a sustained too high, a sustained too low. And then we'd need a longer term solution. So we'd call those long term controls. And that is done by the kidneys. And long term controls, those can be either direct or they can be indirect effects on blood pressure, how we fix it. Okay. Um, so let's jump in. We're first going to start by talking, we're going to kind of just go down the list here this way. We're going to start with short-term controls, the neural ones. Before we jump into the details, I think it's really important to introduce you to the major players of neural controls. We also have to understand why neural controls are making adjustments. Neural controls make adjustments to cardiac output and TPR using the nervous system's um, responses. We want to make sure that there is enough MAP, mean arterial pressure at any one time in the body. And remember that cardiac output and TPR, that those both play a role, okay? We respond to different demands of the body. So when you're exercising, for example, it's really helpful to have more blood flow to our skeletal muscles rather than our GI tract. That's a change, right? And so the body helps us do this by total peripheral resistance, for example, constricting blood flow to those areas that are less needed. In times of exercise, we'd restrict blood flow to our GI tract, for example, and more blood flow to where we need it more, skeletal muscles in the case of exercise. So all of this can be done. In our neural short-term control, we have the cardiovascular center. The cardiovascular center lives in the medulla, the medulla oblongata of our brain. 
the medulla oblongata, thinking back to bio 430, lives in the brain stem. The brain stem, you know, of our brain is really a lot of those goals of the brain stem, a lot of those functions are for survival stuff. So it makes so much sense to me that the cardiovascular center, the thing that helps control our um how fast or slow our heart rate is, how dilated or not dilated our vessels are, is in the brainstem, the survival stuff part of our brain. So it lives in the medulla. Areas of this center, we have um, we have a couple of them. We have a cardio, cardio, accelatory, accelatory center to make the heart faster to accelerate it we have a cardio inhibitory center these two guys work in opposition they work in opposition to each other but we also have a vasomotor center. That controls vasoconstriction or vasodilation. So the cardiovascular center does a lot of things, speed up the heart, slow down the heart, and constrict or dilate our vessels. We also have baroreceptor, that's a new word, baroreceptor reflexes. Baro, that word baro, refers to pressure, and receptor is a receptor, so it's a pressure receptor. Baroreceptors are located in a lot of our major arteries in our neck and thoracic region, but the ones that I really want you to know about are the ones that are in our carotid sinus. And in the aortic arch. So baroreceptor reflexes are really working on detecting that pressure in those vessels. And they do this by detecting stretch. And then they'll send that message then, of course, to the medulla, to our cardiovascular center, um, to relay what's going on and take appropriate actions. Baroreceptors are really good at temporary changes, but they're really good at adapting when there's sustained changes. So in hypertension, when your blood pressure is high all the time, our baroreceptors are like, yeah, everything seems fine, when really it's not. Um, so this is more of a short-term thing, these baroreceptors. Chemical receptors, that's the other one. Chemical receptors, that's a new one. Chemical receptors, as it applies to the cardiovascular system, are also located in the aortic arch and also in like big vessels of our um, of our neck. What chemoreceptors are doing is they're really monitoring the levels of CO2, carbon dioxide, oxygen, O2, and also the pH, how acidic or basic our blood is. And if our pH is thrown off even a little bit, or if our CO2 is thrown off even a little bit, or if our O2 is thrown off enough, then our chemoreceptors are going to be like, hey, everybody, we need to do something about this. And so who does the cardio or the chemo receptor reflexes talk to? Those receptors, um, they talk to the cardiovascular center to do their thing. And this is a side character, so I'm not even going to hi highlight it, but there's higher brain centers, things like the cortex, things like the hypothalamus, um, which aid in the distribution of blood flow, making sure that blood goes to all the right places at the exact right times. Um, just so you know. Okay, so these are neural controls. These are the major players. Oh, I forgot to highlight cardiovascular center. Don't forget to highlight that one. In the middle, highlight a lot. Survival stuff, part of the brain. Okay. So this is a figure from your textbook. And remember I told you, if you get good at those five steps, I think you're going to be really good 
at making sure that you're able to track all of these homeostatic imbalances, okay? Um, so here, let me show you how to read this and then we can kind of go through it. So we have our stimulus, that's our step one. Our stimulus here is all right in red. Our stimulus is that blood pressure rises. So if blood pressure is too high, then in step two, our baroreceptors are gonna detect that blood pressure is too high and they're, they need to say, hello, I am too stretched. Everything is going wrong. Our blood pressure is off, something, something needs to happen. That leads us to step three. In step three, that's when we send our message to our control center. And so there's some conventions here that I want you to be mindful of. Um, whenever we see like a plus, that means stimulate, so activate and inhibit. Shorthand for inhibit is a minus, so kind of like turn off that part. Um, and similarly, inhibit again, turn off. So what happens here is that our baroreceptors, they activate our cardio inhibitory center in the medulla. So that means they activate. So we're working on making sure the heart isn't working so hard. And remember that the cardio inhibitory center and the cardio accelatory center work in opposition most days. So we would assume that if we're activating cardio inhibitory center, we'd downregulate or inhibit the cardio accelatory center, making the heart do more work. Lastly, we're going to inhibit the vasomotor center. So inhibit vasomotor center. I'm writing these out so that we have a chance to chat about them. And then we have our next step which is talking to our effectors. So our step four, there's actually two parts of it. So by having sympathetic input, sympathetic input um, go down. So that's less SNSS, less SNS activity. Less SNS activity, we would expect, like in your notes, cover this, cover that up. You can't see it right now. In your notes, cover it up to guess. If the SNS goes down, we would expect heart rate to decrease. And if heart rate decreases, we would also expect cardiac output to decrease because heart rate influences cardiac output, right? Similarly, we would expect contractility to go down because SNS makes our heart beat harder because the SNS innervates the my, uh, myocardium of the ventricles. So these are things that happen. So all of that decreases by decreasing sympathetic activity. But the vasomotor impulses go down, which means that our vasodilation goes up. So when we turn off the vasomotor center, that leads to vasodilation. Vasodilation. I always think of vasomotor as like we're motoring the vessels to be smaller. And then vasodilation is like relaxing. So if we turn off the vasomotor center, we're relaxing. If our vessel gets bigger, vasodilation, that decreases resistance because there's less resistance. If there's less resistance, less heart rate, less contractility, less cardiac output, those two major things, remember, I'm gonna hop back one slide, or two slides, one slide, two slides. Remember that cardiac output and TPR both influence blood pressure. Both are happening in short-term controls. If both of those happen, then we're going to also decrease blood pressure. Decrease blood pressure. Hopefully back to where we're supposed to go. So do you see how we raise blood pressure? And then at the end, we decrease blood pressure back to where we want it to be. And I'll let you go through this next slide on your own because it's just the opposite. So if blood pressure is step one, is if blood pressure were to go down, then you can follow those five steps to help blood pressure go back up. You all know I love to spoil the ending. So work through that one on your own. 
Okay, so in the short term, we can control blood pressure by the nervous system neurally, but also hormonally. Hormonally, there are, let's see, one, two, three, four hormones I want you to know about. I'll talk a little bit about each of them. And these hormonal controls each have a slightly different effect and different reasons why they affect blood pressure. So there's a really great image, or it's a table actually, in your textbook, and I think you should go look at it. It's right around when all of these hormonal controls are being talked about. Um, okay, so I'll do all my annotations in red. Um, so the adrenal medulla, I just want to make sure that we know, the adrenal medulla is like, okay, so here's your kidney, right? Your kidney looks like a little kidney bean like that. And your kidney has the ureter coming off of it, which takes the urine down to the bladder. That is a really poopy one. Let me make a prettier one for you. So we have our kidney. That's not any better. i will get the point. We have our ureter coming off, but our kidneys wear a hat in the form of a gland. And that hat in the form of a gland that kidneys wear, that's the adrenal gland. And then the inside part of that is the adrenal medulla. Okay. So um, the adrenal medulla releases hormones, and those hormones are epinephrine, norepinephrine. Epinephrine and norepinephrine, um, they increase blood pressure. So the adrenal medulla, those hormones, they lead to the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine. They increase blood pressure um, by sympathetic input because, well, that's what epinephrine and norepinephrine do, right? They, by doing this, they increase, this happens because they increase cardiac output, increase TPR. Because we're really just activating the SNS here by the activity of epinephrine and norepinephrine. Angiotensin 2 is a substance that does a bunch of stuff. Um, we're going to talk about it in the next slide, but it helps with increasing blood pressure. That's the bottom line. Angiotensin 2 increases blood pressure and does a bunch of stuff to get there. Atrial natriuretic peptide. Atrial is the word that I try to remember because this is a substance that's made by the atria. Made by the atria. It's made by the atria, and what it does is it actually decreases blood volume, and therefore decreases blood pressure, because if there's less blood volume, there's less fluid and stuff to put push on those vessel walls. Okay, and then lastly is antidiuretic hormone or ADH. So something that's a diuretic is something that makes you have to pee. So if something is an antidiuretic, that means it's inhibiting urination. Um, and what's it? Uh, it's also called vasopressin, just so you know. But something or ADH rather, is released by the hypothalamus, a little part of the brain. Um, what this does is it increases blood volume and therefore increases blood pressure. It does this because there's less urine for formation. So this causes less urine formation. This happens in the kidneys. We have, so a lot of this stuff, if you're noticing, is near and around the kidneys, and we have a whole unit dedicated to the kidneys, so I don't want to jump too much into the, the details on kidneys, except that just what's relevant for our class at this exact moment. Okay, so if blood pressure starts to be out of whack in a sustained way, that's when we need to go to those long-term controls. These tend to be renal mechanisms because it's done by the kidneys. So I call them 
renal mechanisms. Renal mechanisms. Blood, and remember that long-term controls, we talked about it on a couple slides ago, long-term controls affect blood volume, okay? Blood volume is can vary for a bunch of different reasons, but five liters is where we like to stay. We increase blood volume, we increase blood pressure, and vice versa. Blood volume falls, blood pressure falls. Blood volume might fall if we're like dehydrated, if there's blood loss, that kind of thing, that decreases blood pressure. But this is really dynamic. Homeostasis is a dynamic thing. But we also have to remember that the kidneys are super cool. They do a lot of really cool stuff that we'll talk about when we get there. But if I were to summarize what the kidneys do, they're in charge of filtering the blood. They help us hold on to things that we want, but we get rid of stuff we don't. And a lot of that is fluid because it gets eliminated in the body as urine. It's more complicated than that, but we'll get to it when we get there. So what happens is if the blood volume falls, okay, I'll write this down. If blood volume falls, then that means that blood pressure falls. The kidneys sense that. So then the kidneys hold on to fluid, to water. If we hold on to water, we're holding on to that blood volume. And then the opposite is then true. If blood volume is too big, then we'll get rid of some of that water via the kidneys and it, get rid of it from the body as urine. So the kidneys work directly and indirectly. The direct method is non-hormonal, it just happens. Um, the kidneys, they have receptors to notice how quickly or slowly fluid is coming in there. So if the kidneys are like, wow, this fluid's coming fast, um, well, we're gonna get start to get rid of that fluid. So let me draw you a picture of what I mean here. So if blood pressure falls, blood pressure goes down, then what the kidneys will do is, remember the kidneys are basically just a filter. So then they'll just do less filtration and less reabsorption. They'll just do their job less. Kidney filtration. If the kidneys are doing less filtration, then we'll have less urine. Having less urine means that fluid is staying in the body. So that means that we increase blood volume. By increasing blood volume, then we know that we increase blood pressure. And that makes us happy. And then similarly, the opposite then would be true. If blood pressure is too high, the kidneys will try to do their thing. The other thing is called indirect. And it's called indirect. And I Correct. I'm leaving myself space here because I'm going to draw a little bit. It's called indirect because it's not like blood pressure falls, the kidneys do their thing, and then we're happy again. It's the blood pressure falls, and then the kidneys do a thing which causes another thing, and then blood pressure goes back to normal. So if blood pressure falls, if blood pressure is too low, then what happens is the kidneys, they release this thing, renin. Kidneys release, I'm going to write it in red, renin. Renin is an enzyme. An enzyme is something that helps chemical reactions happen. Enzymes are something that help chemical reactions happen. Um, and so what renin does is through a series of chemical reactions, chemical reactions, through a series of them, um, we form angiotensin II. And I'm doing this in red because this is the most important step. So a series of chemical reactions from the release of renin 
lead to the formation of angiotensin II. And angiotensin II does a bunch of cool stuff. Remember I told you we talk about it, we're talking about it now. So what angiotensin II does is it causes the adrenals, adrenal, the adrenals, they release this hormone called aldosterone. Aldosterone promotes salt retention, uh, well, salt, not salt, sodium. Sodium stays in the blood. And when sodium stays in the blood, that also promotes more water in the blood. This is, this step here is action in the kidney. And we have a whole kidney unit, so I don't want you to worry about the details too much, but it helps water stay in the blood by action of putting sodium back in the blood. Because when there's more stuff in the blood, more water wants to go there because that's how osmosis works. The other thing that angiotensin II does is causes release of ADH, antidiuretic hormone. It also activates the thirst center in our hypothalamus. Little portion of our brain. The thirst center in our brain tell, makes us be conscious of the fact, oh, I need to drink water. And then lastly, it causes vasoconstriction. 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 So our thirst center makes us drink water. Antidiuretic hormone increases the water in the blood. So it is the action of aldosterone. And so does being thirsty. So if we drink water, then we'll increase. Um, so all of those things um, lead to increasing blood volume and therefore increasing blood pressure. Oh, and then this vasoconstriction, I almost forgot about that part. It increases TPR. And if we increase TPR, then of course we also increase blood pressure too. So the indirect mechanism actually has a special name um, and it's named after three portions of these steps. It's the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So it's called the renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism. And that's like a forever long word. So you can also call it R-A-A-S. I mean that S is for system. So renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So you can also call it RAS. Okay, um, so that, that's some long-term controls. So let me show you what we've done here. We've done a lot of things. So we talked about neural controls. We talked about hormonal controls. We talked about direct and indirect mechanisms of the kidneys as long-term controls. Uh, there's lots of details here, but what I really want you to understand is how these three guys affect blood pressure. And so when, um, hopefully by the time that you watch this video, I'll have a blood pressure regulation summary worksheet for you, like a flow chart and things for you to uh, help kind of sort through all of this stuff together and have a good one page summary of, of notes just to help you sort through this stuff. All right, I hope you enjoyed this one.